Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my talk today is a walkthrough of a production incident that occurred uh, and some of the things that we learned from that production incident, both around like managing complex systems, managing microservice-based systems and distributed systems. Just a quick show of hands. Uh, I'm sorry, probably talks have already done this. How many of us identify more on the developer side of the spectrum? Okay, wow, that's different than what I'm used to. Operation side of the spectrum. All right, how many people are managing, are in a microservices environment? Okay, cool. So I'm sorry if I trigger anyone. Um, you know, there might be some weeping, like Bridget said, but don't worry, we'll get through it together. Uh, these are inspired by true events. This is not fan fiction, unfortunately. Uh, we've changed the names and the locations to protect the innocent. Uh, but uh, know that this is not an academic exercise. This is something that actually occurred, so uh, a lot of things that we're gonna be talking about are, are gonna be uh, uncharacteristically uncar real in terms of uh, what you guys are accustomed to seeing in your environments. So what are we gonna talk about? First, I'll give you a brief introduction about myself, where I come from, what my background is like. Walk through the anatomy of a system, walk through an actual incident, we'll go through all of the alerts, the things that we learned about those alerts and the decisions that we made and then ultimately what we learn from our post-mortem process after the alert and uh, after the incident and get an idea of just how bad things actually were. So quick introduction, my name is Jeff Smith. I'm the manager of production operations at Centro. I've been there for about six months. Centro is a media ad services company. Uh, we're also working on a uh, software as a service solution for uh, media ad buyers. So if you're in that space and you wanna talk, you know, find me after the, con after the uh, chat. You can find me on Twitter, Dark and Nerdy, Jeff Smith at Centro.net. I love talking about systems and systems thinking, so if that's something that you're interested in, please feel free to grab me. I also have a blog that I never update at allthingsdork.com. Feel free to uh, check that out, a bunch of stuff from yesteryear. So first, I wanted to talk about the anatomy of a system, right? And what are we talking about when we use this term system? We tend to think of things like the web server, the database, the Redis queue, uh, all of these components and elements of a system, and those are all perfectly valid. Those are parts of the system. But the things that we tend to forget about and not really talk about or focus on are the inputs to the system, right? Because we have to have data coming in, requests coming in, outputs to the system, maybe that feeds another system and kicks off a bunch of work. The feedback loop in that system, how are we providing information about the state of the system inside it? And most importantly, and this is you know, near and dear to my heart, the operators of that system. Because there are people behind this that are actually managing these systems, and they need to understand what's going on in the system, how they can, what levers they have to sort of uh, correct the system when it gets into a bad state. And oftentimes when we're building these things, the operator is the last piece of the puzzle that we forget about. But it's super crucial because when trouble strikes, the operator is gonna be the person that's modifying the system in order to get it or correct it into a more desired state. So let's go with a sort of clinical definition. What is a system? A set of connected things or parts forming a complex whole, right? That's a pretty straightforward example. Um, but I think the thing that gets interesting is that uh, systems are also comprised of other systems, right? So a subsystem is a set of elements which is a system in itself and a component of a larger system. It's turtles all the way down, right? Like, the more you uh, start to peel apart the onion, the more you realize just how complex these things are. So, uh, we'll start with a high level system diagram, right? So when you look at this, it probably doesn't look too different than what you're running in your environment, right? We got a uh, users coming in from the internet, they're hitting an elastic load balancer, that balances across some web servers, we might have elastic cache in there, um, we're reading from a master database, or writing to a master database, reading from a slave database, publishing some message queues, some messages on a queue, we've got worker nodes processing that queue. Pretty familiar, right? It's like, well, if we're being honest, this is probably the ideal system. In a real system, you probably got like MongoDB somewhere over there, some failed Node.js experiment that no one really knows if you can actually unplug, uh, you know. So we're gonna live in this utopia for a second and say like, yeah, this is what a normal system would look like. So systems also have failure modes. 
And a failure mode is basically uh, the particular way in which a system uh, degrades or ultimately fails to perform as intended. And the interesting thing about failure modes is the number of failure modes tends to grow as the system has more components and becomes more complex. So, for example, let's take our same happy system, right? And then suddenly we say the worker nodes die. That's going to create a particular failure scenario that is different than if another component failed, right? In this particular scenario, it might be something as simple as email processing isn't happening. Or it could be something uh, catastrophic where work isn't flowing through the system. If the read database fails, that's a different failure scenario. Each subsystem that fails can produce an entirely different type of failure. And then if we have both of them fail, well, that's yet another failure mode. The thing to take away from this is it becomes incredibly difficult to predict how a system is going to fail as it grows and becomes more complex. So you might be in test and think you have all of these scenarios figured out, then you get to production and you're like, huh, we, we didn't see that in testing, that's weird, right? How many, has anyone encountered that? No, you're all geniuses? Yeah, that's what I thought, that's what I thought. Don't let lunch get in the way here, like put your hands up, you know you're part of this. Then to make it even more complicated, each one of these systems is a subsystem, like we talked about, right? So while we've got this nice little cute high-level node that we can show to management and say, these are web servers, in reality, we know that underneath that is another layer of complexity that we barely understand, right? So when you're thinking about that, you have to think about how you view the system and at what level of the system you're actually viewing it. You need to be able to zoom in and out at different levels. So now we'll do a quick walkthrough of failure. How many, how many have been involved in a major production incident? Show of hands. How many people have been absolutely thrilled and happy with how those incidents actually play out? I want to talk to you after. That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, typically when I do it, it's, uh, it's kind of like a system. It's a bit of a shit show. Uh, different variety every time, right? Something else breaks down. So there's always a chance to learn and sort of like uh, evaluate what it is that you did right, what it is you did wrong, and what it is that you're never going to do again. Um, so uh, we're going to look at this particular situation. So this is our troubled system. Again, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Um, I'll walk you through real quickly how the system operates. So we've got users that are coming in and they're making an execution request. Right? We've got a set of nodes at the AWS layer, uh, at the top of the AWS layer that are going to take those requests, publish them on a message queue for processing. See, this is going to look like a real system because you're going to be like, why are you doing this? <laughs> then we have another set of nodes that reads those messages and what you think, process them, right? No, it's going to ask another system to process those messages for us in a remote data center, our actual legacy data center. Once those requests are made in the legacy data center, they are put on yet another message bus in which the actual work gets done. Um, so it functions a little bit like government where there's a lot of handoffs and not a lot of shit getting done, but uh, eventually it makes its way down to a worker and we actually do some magical things. So the first sign of alert, the first sign of trouble that we got during this incident was that execution requests are taking longer than a predefined threshold. So that alert was helpful on a few levels and not helpful on a few others, right? The, the first pro is that, yay, we know the business impact because we're all, we all care about the business impact, right? Right? Come on, guys. Yeah, business impact is fine. Load average doesn't mean shit if people aren't getting their orders processed. So we understand the business impact right away. But the problem is we don't really know where the problem is. We know that the message processes are moving slowly, but at what layer of the system, at what portion? So it's great for your boss to come and like, what's going on? Stuff is broke, dog. It's just broke. Like, all right, well, what's broke? Well, messages aren't getting processed. <laughs> it's not really helpful. So then the next alert we got was this queue alert telling us that the queue in AWS was backed up. There were a lot of messages above some other predetermined generic threshold. So now we're thinking to ourselves, oh, we can't process work fast enough. We need more workers. 
Part of that is because our alerts lack context, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But you know, when you've got an alert saying the message queue is high, is it because volume is increased? Is it because you're processing slower than you typically are? What are the age of the messages? There's all these questions that you have that you know, when you were in staging, seemed fine and perfectly reasonable. Oh, well, see, the queue is empty, that's good. Queue is high, that's bad. That's enough information, right? Nope. The next alert we got was a connection alert on the messaging service in the data center. So now, as we're about to scale out the worker nodes, this alert fires and we go, huh. The first question is like, who wrote that alert? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, that's, that's pretty cool. I didn't even know we had that thing. That's, 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 that's good information. So we SSH out of the box and we're like, all right, well, what's going on? Why is this happening? So when we looked at the box, we noticed that there were a lot of connections in this closed wait state on the message server. Uh, how many people remember their TCP uh, flow control there? Yeah, see, in the heat of the moment, we didn't, right? So we're like, closed wait. That's when it's waiting for it. No, 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 that's not when it's waiting. That's when it's trying to do the other thing. That, so all right, just go to Wikipedia. Let's verify this. Let's get it all out on the table, right? So <laughs> if you're like me, Maybe you're thinking like, well, maybe I could use a refresher. So basically, uh, the client has initiated the close and said, yeah, we're done, we're good. And the server gets that and says, all right, I'm gonna call close on my socket. That'll send out the fin packet, the ad packet, life is good, right? So when we see all these connections in a, fail, in a closed wait state, we're going, hmm, why isn't the server closing these connections? Seems odd. So as we started looking at it, we're noticing the close weights are rising and rising and rising. Memory usage is rising, rising and rising. And it's getting to the point where we're starting to freak out and we're like, hmm, this thing is either gonna go down because we do it <laughs> or because these connections do it. So what are we gonna do? Let, let's opt for shutting it down ourselves, right? Because, I mean, how bad could that possibly be? <laughs> right? let's, let's just shut it down. Let's see what happens, right? Let's do a thing. All right, so we'll shut it down. Yeah, that happened. So these herds of connections come in after we get the service back up, right? And it just murders the messaging server, right? So we're like, all right, messaging server is up. Oh, nope, sorry, that's, it's not up. So I'm gonna do that one more time, guys. So I'm just gonna restart. All right, we're back. Nope. Nope, we're still down. Like, okay. Now everything's broken. What did we do? So then, of course, what do you do in that scenario, right? You say, all right, well, let's shut down everything that's connecting to it, right? And meanwhile, your boss is like, really? Really? So now we're going to shut down everything? Like, yeah. Or we wait till midnight <laughs> when, when demand dies down. I don't know. You pick. So we shut down all of the uh, consumers and producers. We bring up the messaging server. Then we slowly ramp up the consumers and producers. Of course, your boss is like, well, how much more time? Like, I, I, I don't. I don't. We're, we're going to five? Five. Five what? Yes, five. We'll just, just back off for a second. So after an undetermined, uh, undisclosed amount of time, we've got the system back up. Yay! So then what's the first thing you think to yourself? Because guess what? The problem is still here. <laughs> now we're just up and we're like, sweet. Now we've got another 30 minutes before it crashes on its own. So um, what's the first thing you do in that scenario? You're troubleshooting. Anybody? Anybody? What changed, right? Some obscene stat, like 80% of changes are caused by human actual, like an actual change that a human did. So especially if you're in operations, the first thing you're like, well, my system hasn't changed in months, so it's <laughs> got to be code. But that's the first thing we reach for, what changed? And this is where being able to track your changes comes in huge, right? And I'm not talking about change control boards. I'm not saying that you need some bureaucrat in a suit who knows nothing about JavaScript approving and denying changes. But what I am talking about is, as you empower people to deploy their own code or you know, have a particular group of deploy code, you need some sort of audit log to be able to track back and say who did what when. Because at this point, right now, we're just screaming at each other in a room, what, what, what changed? I don't know. Stop yelling at me. We luckily did find. Uh, a series of changes that went out that day. Um, some of them weren't really suspicious, logging aggregation, file rule changes, logo redesign, changed messages to keep processes, wait, what? 
text, all right? That sort of jumped out at us, and we're like, huh. Interesting that that changed today. So let's dive into that one. So the change was fairly innocuous, increased the number of worker threads from 10 to 20, some other sort of unrelated changes. But then we look and we're like, you know, I don't, I don't Java a lot, but this looks like it's going to create a TCP connection for every message it processes. Seems bad. So we call up a developer and like, hey, Dev, we're looking. He's like, oh, God, yeah, that's it. That's totally it. OK, sweet. So then what do you do? Don't be shy. That's right. You roll it back. Why? Because we're paranoid, right? Rolling back what changed is always a good idea. Why is it always a good idea? Because when you have a change and there's a problem with the system, you have to think about your confirmation bias that's always going on in the back of your head, right? You've always got this noodle in the back of your head that's going to make it very difficult for you to let go of that idea. In the back of your mind, you're thinking like, yeah, I mean, I guess we could add more capacity, but you know, that change, I don't know. It seems really suspicious, right? And you end up cutting yourself off to other possible avenues of explanation. So it's almost worth it just to be able to remove that from the table, and you can say, all right, Bob, shut up. We rolled back. It's still broken. What next, right? As opposed to constantly relitigating that piece. So rolling back the change is always a good idea, except when it's not. Because <laughs> it's so complicated, right? It's so complicated. You get into these microservice worlds, and right, you know, like, okay, we'll put it out there, right? Well, all your changes are supposed to be backwards compatible, and you're never supposed to change your interface because that's the standard that we're all, but yeah, okay, I get it, right? But uh, shit happens, right? How many people have like a breaking change to their API interface? Oh, you're all too proud. All right. Well, let me know where you work when you're done, because. Uh, I want to work with you guys. So we have a scenario where uh, we've got a worker process expecting version 1.5 of an endpoint or an interface. And then we roll it back to version 1.0. What does that do? I, I don't know. Right? I, I have no idea. Right? It seems like it should work. So now what are you doing? You're wasting time trying to find devs to, under, to get an understanding. Like, so if I roll this back, and they're like, wait, wait, why are we rolling back? Just catch up. We're rolling back. What's going to happen? I, I don't know. Now, if you're lucky, you're in a scenario where the code has been designed in such a way that only part of it breaks, right? There's some added functionality that done, doesn't get processed, right? That's your best case scenario. Your worst case scenario is Ragnarok. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you kind of have to just roll with it and, and hope for the best. The other problem that you run into, though, is guess what never got tested? Yeah. You're not rolling back to a known state. You're in old, new, you're in like an entirely new uncharted territory. You're in a world that has just never been dreamed up, and I don't know why, right? No one ever thought about it. We're like, well, what if we only roll back half of it? And they're like, Pfft. would that really happen, though? <laughs> We're probably good, right? So your whole point of doing this was to roll back to a known good state, but now you're actually rolling back to a state that has never been tested, has never been figured out, and now you're just, you know, kind of like, shit, what are we going to do? So we rolled back, we restarted the messaging server. Lo and behold, everything worked. We're like, OK, sweet. That was good. It's fixed. But is it? <laughs> is it really? Because the problem is, when we, when we think about resolving these production incidents, you know, I, I blame ITIL, right? Because in your mind, you're like, it's incident management. It's about restoring services. Everything else comes after that. So a lot of times, you're like, well, server's up. Sweet. I'm done. Right? But we don't have a compelling story as to why this happened. We don't really know, like, well, well, what was it that created this particular scenario? It's easy to say, like, oh, yeah, the, you know, the, the TCP socket thing changed, right? And uh, that's why everything failed. But we still don't have an actual explanation. So being the uh, morbidly curious person I am, we decided to have a pretty strong uh, retro on this. And there were a few things that we missed during the outage. Let me know if any of these sound familiar or unless most of you are devs and you were sleeping when this went down. Uh, the message server ran out of memory. We missed that. We missed it because we had a deluge of alerts, right? Like, so you, you, everyone knows that scenario where like, oh, the database is down, so now everything is alerting, right? Uh, it was one of those scenarios. The message queue was important enough where we were firing off alerts for a bunch of stuff, and then you're like, shut up, and you silence it, but then you silence the alert that matters. 
which is really, really problematic. The other thing that we missed was that there were bad connection attempts for the uh, close weight state that was happening after the rollback. So we rolled back, we waited for a little bit, we patted ourselves, you know, we did the chest bump, like, yeah, we did it. Now just restart the message server and we're gone, we're going home. Um, but we missed the fact that after we rolled back, the system was still creating these closed weights. So that means like, hmm, the rollback wasn't actually the fix. And then the third thing, <laughs> uh, the message queue service had a series of thread errors. How many of you guys have normal errors? Oh, come on, really? Nobody has normal errors in their log? You guys are going to hell, you know that. <laughs> Maybe I'm just working at the wrong places, I don't know. But yeah, there was a series of normal errors uh, and they sort of got lost in the logs and we missed it. I told you this was gonna be a real talk, so I'm calling y'all out. Sorry, this thing was, when your message clicker thing comes with a repair kit, <laughs> it's a bad sign. So I'll just make sure my space is over here. Um, so the message thread error thing was interesting, right? So, so one thing that I think uh, a lot of people, especially when they're new to open source, miss out on is the fact that it's open source. So if there's an exception, chances are there is a literal string in the code base with that exception message. It's amazing how many people like miss out on that when they're trying to troubleshoot something. So sure enough, we say, oh, let's grab for this thing in the law. Oh, look at that. This is telling us what this thread was actually doing. So what actually ended up happening was there was a thread that was responsible for something that died. And because of the out of memory condition, the, the thread couldn't be restarted. So that helped us sort of narrow down on like, okay, that could be what, what's causing this. Let's look and see what this thing does. Probably nothing important, except for that whole closing sockets thing asynchronously. So as we navigated through the code, basically what happened was, whenever a socket gets closed, the process that handles that doesn't actually close the socket immediately. It marks it dirty and then puts it on a queue, and then there's an asynchronous process that comes through and closes those sockets later. That thread dies, guess what? You get a bunch of close weights. So we're like, oh, this is brilliant. How the hell would you design an alert for that, right? Like, uh, with forethought, right? Like, I mean, after the building's burning down, you're like, man, we really should have put smoke detectors in that shower. But, right? <laughs> but like, during the incident or even before, you wouldn't even think about like, yeah, I don't know. Smoke detectors in the shower seems a little like overkill. Why don't we just see how it goes, right? Yeah. So then we started piecing together the story and we were like, oh, maybe it was related to the number of connections, right? Because we had the out of memory thing, right? So we noticed that as closed weights were going up, memory usage was going up. So it kind of makes sense, right? That like, oh, maybe the number of connections is a problem. So we start asking ourselves, how many connections can we support? Again, this is like, you know, brilliant insight after the fact. You should probably think about this before you go opening your server up to have tons of connections to it. Because this is capacity planning 101. So we're looking and we're saying, okay, uh, I don't see this anywhere in config management being set. Looks like we're not setting it. Oh, all right, well, system has to have a default, right? Of course it does. Every system has a default, and it's probably a sensible default. Yeah, yeah, it was a sensible default. Real sensible. Because, <laughs> I mean, come on, right? If your server can't handle like 2.8 billion connections or whatever, you're probably doing it wrong. Like, I literally screamed when I saw this. I was like, no! But it's my fault, right? Because I should have been setting this. So what did we learn during this whole big thing? We learned a few things. Um, we learned something about how root causes aren't always a thing, right? When your boss says, well, what caused this thing? When you list out five things, he's like, no. What was the thing that caused, I, I don't know, particle acceleration? I have no idea. <laughs> like, what caused all of this stuff to happen all at once, right? It's fate, 
it's kids. I don't know. So was it the message queue changes? Was it the worker threads that said, oh, we're going to go from 10 to 20 and then screw up how we handle TCP? Possible, right? But that doesn't mean that some other event couldn't have created a large number of connections that we weren't protected against, right? Maybe some auto-scaling thing on the number of workers. Was it the low memory message, uh, the low memory on the message server? It's possible, right? But would we have been having memory pressure if it weren't for that erroneous system beforehand? Probably not, or at least not so rapidly. That is one thing we were monitoring and tracking, so we had an idea of like what our headroom was like. Was it the lack of max connection settings? Possibly. It's never been a problem before. Not really a good excuse when your boss is yelling at you. But I think the thing that we learned is, like, even when you are talking about systems under your purview, under your control, you have to defend it against bad actors, even if those bad actors sit three cubes away from you. All right? You, you have to defend yourself. No one would put an AP, shouldn't say that. Most people wouldn't put a public API out without some sort of rate limiting, right? You have to do something similar inside. You have to make sure that you're defending these systems against all bad actors in all bad scenarios. And we really didn't learn a fourth thing. I just had a hard time modifying the template. <laughs> so I just, just being honest. <laughs> I'm really bad at uh, paint, Photoshop, and, and PowerPoint. And I was like, oh, this is a great template. But I thought really hard to try to figure a fourth bullet, too. It didn't, didn't really click. Um, the other thing we learned, metrics need context, right? So we were talking about systems and operating at systems at different levels, right? So um, sometimes people have like the one giant dashboard that lists everything. And sometimes that's good, but sometimes that's overwhelming, right? You're like, all right, something's, oh, Jesus! <laughs> There's just graphs everywhere, right? And when you're in a scenario where you don't really understand what the problem is, you'll latch on to anything, right? You're like, oh, well, see, see how that was like normal? And then it went up like that, and it, yeah. This is the problem for sure. And you're like, what are you, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> it's like ping latency or something, right? Like, wh what made you think that crashed the database server? I don't know, but this graph looks really suspicious. So you, you kind of have to, you kind of have to give your, your graphs context, right? So one of the things that we uh, looked at doing was uh, having uh, some very high level KPIs for a system that we could very quickly look at and rule in or out if the system was in a decent state, right? It wasn't. Uh, pinpoint specific, but you know, if you're in an airplane, right, like, I don't know, let's say, I, I don't know, the pilot had a heart attack or something, you gotta take over the cockpit. Like, Where did that come from? You have, <laughs> you uh, jump into the cockpit, right, and you're looking at a bunch of dials, right, and you know that all of them have different detail levels, right, but the minute you see one that's like that, right, going towards the red, you're like, we should look into this, <laughs> right, if we're gonna land this thing. Similar thing, doesn't mean you don't have more detailed graphs anywhere, but something for a quick, uh, breeze through. Um, the other thing is clarifying points of data. So like we had a large number of messages in the message queue at first. How's that correlate though to order volume? Is the order volume just high? How old are the messages? What's the average length or uh, average uh, age of the message? Anything that can let you know like is this the byproduct of something else happening in the system or is it the actual problem? And it can help you quickly uh, sort of narrow down on those things. Logs, 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 logs. Uh, centralized logging or table stakes, right? Does anyone not have centralized logging in their environment? I, see, I asked the negative, because you guys aren't raising your hands anyways. Who has centralized logging in their environment? Okay, good. Yeah, it's table stakes, right? Because without this, in a distributed environment with multiple servers, you're losing time SSHing into every server and looking. And then if there's anyone watching, they're looking at you like, what the hell are you doing? They're like, oh yeah, I gotta get the logs, right? You don't wanna be that, you don't wanna be that person. Um, also being able to separate the signal from the noise, right? So we were talking about a ton of exceptions that were happening throughout the event, right? Just being able to elevate certain errors out of that mess is very helpful. So one quick, simple, dirty thing we did was, uh, give me a count of errors based on the class that's throwing them, right? So then you quickly see, oh, there's 389 dealing with this class. But then you look at it and you realize, like, you know, I don't know, it's 
some normal error that you always see. So you can say, oh, okay, I can uh, eliminate this from my train of thought. This guy knows what I'm talking about. He's like, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, your mileage is gonna vary on that, but like, find out ways that you can quickly elevate the signal from the noise in the logs, because once a problem happens, the logs are just spewing, they're just spewing, and you're, you're quickly, you know, like that, uh, like that cavalcade of dashboard metrics, you're just gonna grab onto anything and waste a lot of time. It's easy to lose alerts when there's a ton of activity going on. And the thing that we, we sort of look at it is like, imagine you're a firefighter and you're fighting a fire. It's important to know that another fire has sprung up in the garage next door, right? Because that changes the landscape of the problem that you're fighting. It's the same thing with alerts. You may have a lot of alerts that are firing for the same problem, but a new alert might fire that is pertinent to the problem that you're solving. In our case, it was the low memory error. If we had seen that, that might have changed our trajectory of troubleshooting. But because it got lost in the logs, lost in the, uh, lost in the noise, we completely missed it. Constant paging, too. Like, that was something that just popped up because, like, you silence the alerts, and this is probably a hint for how long this went on. You silence the alert, and the alert silence clears, and it comes back, and it pages again, or something else pages again. So make sure that you've got ways to sort of deal with and manage that. Uh, some, some companies are, are uh, leaning towards, like, identifying a scribe that sort of, like, handles all of that stuff and is taking notes. You know, maybe you just turn off all alerting for everyone except for the scribe. But I think the key thing is, even though it's like, oh, yeah, that's pretty easy to do, you'd be amazed how actually complicated it is unless you've set up a system to do that quickly beforehand, right? Because now you're like, oh, man, i got to remove this group and this group. I forgot that group, but this group needs to sit up. So if you plan it ahead of time, you can very easily just go in and say, boop, we're in danger mode, and only Bob is getting the alerts because Bob drew the short straw. Uh, services like Big Panda help to solve this, um, but uh, something that we learned, you, I thought there was like some like DevOps sprinkle stuff that I was just going to be able to put on Big Panda and some stuff was going to magically appear and everything was going to be fixed. It turns out they actually need you to define those alerts because they don't have insight into your systems and how things are structured. Who knew? <laughs> so that was a fun three months and you know, you don't dedicate time to it, but like Big Panda is a, is a great solution that kind of uh, solves that problem, and there's others like it, but know that you have to put work into it. So don't think you're gonna, you know, I don't know, set up a two week uh, trial and just have everything figured out. So what did we talk about? Uh, talked about the anatomy of system, how complexity increases as the system grows. We walked through our own very personal uh, poop show it was exciting. Um, most failures are caused by change, by human change. So always think about what change and have access to what change very quickly in your environment. Um, root cause analysis is difficult. Um, sometimes there are a number of things that are happening at once that put the system into a predetermined, that in, put it into a state that allows that error condition to happen. So sometimes it's not just one thing. Sometimes it's a collection of things. And you always have to keep that in mind and be cognizant of it. Things we learned, give your alerts context. Aggregated logging is table stakes. You absolutely have to have it. And uh, manage your alerts so you don't miss out on state changes during the outage. That's my talk. Uh, what the hell was that? Oh, right, remember to rate your session. I forgot I added that late. That's it, thanks. All right, and I think uh, Jeff said that he would be willing to take a couple of questions. If yeah. I have a couple of questions, and no, I'm not using the app, so if you have a question, put your hand up and ask it the old-fashioned way. I can't I see one see, back there. I can't yeah. actually see There's the back, a, so here It's we a go. huge, bright bulb shining at me. It's so damn hot. So you advocate for rolling back um, with a really good continuous delivery pipeline if you've figured out what's wrong, what's wrong with rolling forward? If you figured out what's wrong, absolutely nothing. But then you're sort of in a different incident management state, right? Because now you're talking about you're actually deploying the fix, which is cake. So if you can figure that out and roll forward, by all means, do that. Fair enough. But we were kind of like, ah! And people are like, what? A lot of jazz hands.
I, I actually, I have a question myself while we're waiting to see if other people want to ask them. Um, it looks like you had a fair amount of detail, you know, at your disposal to put this talk together. Can you talk a little bit about what the postmortem for this kind of incident looked like? Sure. Yeah. So uh, the postmortem was, um, so for this particular incident, because of the impact, it was a little more detailed than, than we might normally go into. So um, it started with the war room, right? And we did it as quickly, as early as possible, right after the meeting. It was sort of a late night, so I think we started the very first thing in the morning. Um, and the first thing we did was walk through the timeline, right? Like, what did we know? What do we know? And when do we know it happened? And then we basically drew some circles around things that had question marks around it, right? So we had identified like w the steps that we took and the alerts that we got fairly easily, but then the questions really dove into, all right, but why did this happen and how can we get more information? So it was really around that connection failed process that we said, all right, let's blow this up. So one of the things that we do is we say, what are all of the different systems that are communicating? Can we blow those pieces up and then validate that each of those pieces was operating correctly or efficiently? You know, so we were using Datadog so there was a lot of good metrics out there if you knew to look for them. Even metrics that we weren't dashboarding but were being collected. So there were a number of times where we said, oh, well, we've got this metric for the HTTP connection pool. Let's take a look at that. So it was really about taking up, uh, taking the system, breaking it into its elements, and then drilling into each of those elements until we came up with a story. And then once we came up with a story, it was a matter of saying, all right, is this plausible? How can we try to prove it? And it's real hard sometimes to, to uh, recreate situations in a production environment, or in a test environment, um, but if you can put together a compelling story, you can probably put together a set of test criteria so that if it happens again, you can prove that that was the case or not. And in this case, it was simple as, did this thread die? Does it still exist? <laughs> and are we still generating closed weight states? Nice, awesome. Okay, another question here. Uh, with respect to the timeline and the postmortem, do you guys, uh, or do you find that you just base things off log times, or do you go to chat logs, emails, to try and also delineate the delta between an event occurring and when the team knows about it and communicates? It's actually a combination of the two. Um, you know, we, we uh, the scribe always is dictating when someone reported a thing, and then later we'll backfill that with the alerting. So in, in a couple of scenarios, uh, not this particular incident, but we've had scenarios where it's like customer service reported X, our first alert didn't fire till 15 minutes later. What was it that customer X saw and how can we make an alert around that? And that's just you know, part of the process of iterating and always getting better. Um, but uh, you, you definitely need to tie those two things together uh, because it's very easy to think that your alerting is in place but you don't realize that someone was encountering a problem beforehand. And the other thing too is to not always accept your known understanding of when a thing happened. You might want to solicit more information from people or other users in the system to say, hey, were you experiencing this problem? Yeah, I had this weird intermittent thing, but I would just log out and log back in and it went away. And it's like, oh, that could be the seeds of this thing that's starting to manifest. Not in this particular case, but we've definitely had that in other cases where once we've widened the web, so to speak, people are like, oh yeah, I, I was having problems. I was working from home and I noticed this, but I just assumed it was VPN because VPN sucks. Um, because you, I, we have one more question right here too, but I'm wondering uh, if you can elaborate um, a tiny bit more on, you mentioned the scribe role, and I don't know if everybody runs their incidents like that, so can you mention what, what you, clarify what you meant there? Sure, so um, when an incident is occurring, um, and this is, uh, you know, pretty much ripped right out of the Google SRE handbook, uh, when an incident is occurring, we try to assign particular roles. Uh, two people, right? So there's the incident commander who's responsible for sort of shepherding the entire incident process. Um, there's another role, the incident scribe, and the scribe is sort of responsible for making sure he, they are documenting everything that sort of occurred. Uh, when did an alert fire? When did we um, escalate to so-and-so? When did we decide to pull the big red switch and shut the site down? The scribe is sort of documenting all of that. Then you've got this, uh, another role for resource wrangling so that if the incident commander decides that we need to bring on a dev, we don't have to you know, figure out who's gonna do that. The incident resource manager says, hey, we need a dev. And they say, okay, I'm gonna run and grab the dev. And then you've got the people that are actually troubleshooting the issue under the direction of the incident commander. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I would like to ask this. What did you do to prevent this to happen in future? <laughs> 
put in max connection setting. Uh, <laughs> low hanging fruit. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we put in a max connection setting. Um, we already had that connection alert, and we never really did figure out where that came from. Um, because it was sort of interesting that you know no one on the team had remembered actually putting that in, um, but we leveraged that a little bit. And then uh, because we were using uh, aggregated logging, we were using Splunk. We could set an alert on uh, particular threads dying. We didn't we didn't have a good way at the time, although I can think of tools to do it now. We didn't have a good way at the time to uh, check and see because if the thread dies, it gets restarted. Right? It's only this OOM condition that uh, made it difficult for it to start. So we did alert on this thread dying in particular, which was actually a rare scenario. We were just lucky enough to have it happen twice. Um, but we do have an alert for that thread exception. Um, so it's more detection um, with, a little, with a little ounce of prevention. All right, um, thank you so much, Jeff. And if you want to uh, hear more from Jeff, I forgot to mention this this morning, but all the speakers from the track today um, for the most part, with one exception, are doing uh, the podcast tomorrow. So you'll be uh, chatting more about, you know, incident response. Lots and dealing of with the, all of the sadness. We'll process our sadness together. But when it's over, you get the high five, right? And you're like, yeah, we did it. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so thank you so much. And uh, once again, give it up for Jeff. Jeff.